everybody, welcome to the February Engineering um, FGU. Um, here's the agenda, what we're gonna go through today. Uh, I'll update you on our OKRs, a nice engineering survey we did, um, talk a little bit about changes to our lease process, um, some status on the availability of gitlab.com. Um, looks like releases in there twice, oops. Um, update on people, some challenges, and then we'll go to questions. So if you have questions, start populating them in, uh, in chat. Um, so first, uh, uh, update on the GCP migration project. Um, we did a course correction here, so we will be moving to uh, GCP as quickly as possible using the current Omnibus installer and then iterating towards um, uh, continuous delivery and adopting our cloud native stuff uh, over time after that. Andrew talked about this in his infrastructure um, FGU on Friday, so I linked to the presentation here. Um, that's got all the detail, and if you have questions, uh, by all means, ask him. Um, but I, I won't be covering it more in this uh, in this presentation. Um, so next, OKRs, uh, we got them completely scored and retrospected on. Um, I did some back of the napkin math and we uh, achieved about 60% of them, which is up from uh, about 20 to 30% in past quarters, which is, which is great and incrementally getting to where we wanna be, which is about 80%. Um, and we did that through a combination of things. Um, first and foremost, you know, if you're at 20 or 30%, it's like, let's make sure we're setting more realistic goals. It's not like we can just say, hey, work harder and get from, you know, 20% to 100%. It's, we're taking on too much. So we asked every team to really think about what's the highest priority stuff they could be working on. And then establish a cut line and say, we're not going to do anything sort of below this. And then we, we demonstrated incremental improvement. Um, and we hope to dial that up again in Q1 and, and get in that kind of like 80% range. Uh, if you're doing that on a regular basis, it means you're, uh, you're taking on aggressive but achievable goals and you're leaving that kind of range from, a, from 80 to 100% for like, you know, your best quarter ever. That's for sort of overachievement. Um, so we got the, uh, the first iteration of our Q1 OKRs pick, uh, kicked off on the first day of the quarter, which is great. So people have the entire quarter um, to, to address them. Uh, and we added a couple of things. Uh, one, we noticed that uh, open source uh, or community sourced uh, MRs were declining. So each team is going to take responsibility for um, at least making sure that the backlog of uh, open source contributions is uh, is groomed and up to date. But certainly that includes merging more than, than we have in uh, or than we did in Q4. Um, and then also adding a goal to make sure that each team delivers 100% uh, of their uh, commitments for each release. Um, and we don't have a, a mechanized way to track this right now. So we came up with a process whereby um, I think it's about every eighth of the month. So after the feature freeze, um, managers will go in, look at what they committed to for, for that release and update their, uh, their KR. Um, because of course those items typically then roll over to the next release and we lose the ability to, to account for them. So we're gonna track this manually. But again, the goal is to make sure that uh, they are uh, representing accurately the bandwidth that they have to their product managers. If, if we're doing 20% of what we can um, uh, commit to in a release, um, that means we're just not we're just not prioritizing effectively enough. And then when teams get into that like seventy percent range, it's like okay, push harder. Let's focus on productivity. That's the way you kind of close that gap. Um, next, the engineering survey. So uh, Jessica Mitchell and People Ops was kind enough to really drive this. Her and I worked together on the questions we we're going to ask, and she put it together in Google Forms and and did this nice analysis. Um, so big thanks to her. Um, the, uh, the highlights here are, um, you know, I have a clear understanding of GitLab.com company objectives, uh, 93%. I think that's, that's unusually high compared to what I've seen at, at past companies, and so that's great. I think the fact that we have public OKRs uh, goes a long way towards uh, um, uh, closing this gap. And I think Sid is also, he's very clear and directed. Like, we don't have 50 goals, we've got three, you know, and he talks about them a lot. And so people say they, they're receiving that, which is good. Um, even more importantly, the next one, I understand how my work contributes to GitLab.com objectives and goals, 97%. And this is really important because at past companies and here, I've seen this question be the, by far the biggest driver towards engagement. If people understand how they're contributing to the rest of the company, they're very engaged, um, they like their work, and most importantly, when something comes on your plate that isn't necessarily fun or intrinsically motivating, the fact that you can map it to something very important for your coworkers or for the company allows you to kind of get excited about it in a different way. So 97%, this was, this was really, really great to see. 
Um, in terms of engineering leadership, uh, people feel pretty good about, about their, their managers, uh, which is fantastic, almost 90%. Um, and, and likewise, engagement. This is sort of roll-up number. P people are, are generally highly engaged. Uh, we can, of course, do better, but uh, you know, didn't know what to expect. We're establishing a baseline here, and, and this was this was nice to see. It was this high. In terms of lowlights, um, I I plucked out four here. Um, one is um, decisions made by the exec team. People feel that they're not communicated out uh, in a in a timely manner, so we can make progress on that. Um, is the exec team paying careful attention to employee suggestions? People don't feel that that's happening, so we can make progress on that. Um, within the engineering team, uh, my manager is consistent, timely, and fair feedback. Um, people don't feel like they're getting that. Um, I've actually seen this before at my company immediately prior, and we were able to fix this through some changes to uh, to one on ones. And so we'll do that same thing here and see if this if if this uh, if people don't change their feelings about this uh, by the next survey. Maybe we'll do this every six months or so. Um, and then the other big one was I understand what I need to do uh, to advance in my career. So uh, I actually had already taken on an OKR to redo our job descriptions and come up with some career matrices and things like that. So, um, you know, that aligns perfectly with this, but certainly my urgency to do that one and make sure we do that one well is, is a lot higher because I think this was the single um, lowest uh, favorability rating for any, any questions. So we hear you, we'll make progress on this and, uh, and we'll, we'll make it better. Um, similar to the retrospective meeting, you know, I, I, the first time I went to one of those, I said, you know what, there's, a world where you're taking on 50 action items at a meeting like that, or you're taking zero, the, the, the middle ground is where we want to be. So we started in the retrospective, really just allowing one action item from each retrospective. And over time, sure enough, we've noticed things get better uh, from taking on just like a, a focused item. So out of this survey, there's lots of stuff to do, but these are the two that I want to focus on and make progress on, the feedback issue and the career tracking issue. And if we solve these next time around, hopefully we see them improved and then we'll move on to the, to the next one. But I don't want to spread Myself or my manager is too thin. Let's let's knock these two ones um, out of the park. Um, so again, big thanks to, to Jessica. She was kind enough to analyze all the results by team, uh, and the link to the presentation is here, so people can read these, dive in. There were some qualitative questions, and uh, and people can read through the answers as those as well. Um, it's basically unredacted, so it's it's the raw data. We're an open, transparent company. I was comfortable just sharing sharing everything with with anybody. Um, something I thought was interesting, some people did have uh, concerns about the survey. We did ask what team you're on. Some people felt like, well, this is anonymous. Is that really okay? I think it is. Like, we only group teams that have enough critical mass where you really, you know, if, if it's a team of two, we didn't, we didn't show per team results because, yeah, it would be pretty obvious who that was. We group teams that have a, a relatively large headcount of people um, to, to increase anonymity. But it's important because it showed things like, you know, some of these things that were general trends did not appear on the UX team. That means Sarah doesn't need to have a sense of urgency about fixing those. She can move on to other other things. Likewise, there was something on the front end team that no other team really demonstrated, which was people don't feel secure speaking up in big meetings on that team. So that's something that our the leadership of our front end team, they can zoom in a little bit. They know they have an issue that, that other teams don't have and they can concentrate on it. So that's, that's why we're asking, you know, people to kind of self-identify what teams they're on. Um, even more interesting, uh, Jessica grouped the teams that, uh, or the people rather, were not comfortable um, identifying what team they were on, and those people had more negative answers to other questions. And so, you know, we can address those problems generally, but we can't do it in this more targeted way. So, you know, I hope that um, we build trust in people to want to fill out the survey and to, to self-identify. It's just going to make us more effective in addressing some of these goals. Um, so moving on, um, uh, GitLab.com availability and performance. Uh, the first thing to say is that um, this monitoring is not nearly as sophisticated as it needs to be. So you know, take these numbers with a grain of salt. But um, look at the trend. You know, through a combination of manual QA and thanks to BJ for organizing it and the product managers for stepping up and doing a bunch of it, and a lot of other people as well, that had an impact. Uh, the changes to our lease process that Marin has been driving had a huge impact, and uh, we're able, at least for our issue page, to check in with a, with a month that's, a, that's 100%. But again, more importantly, you can clearly see the trend going up and to the right. Um, in January, we dipped a little bit. We took some downtime due to the, uh, the Intel bug that affected everybody, the, the chip bug. Um, but, uh, you know, we can annotate that one away and say, you know, that's, that's not something that would have been under our control. But things have gotten... Uh, uh, much better in terms of performance and availability on dot com. So thanks to everybody who's doing things the hard way to make that happen. 
Um, releases, uh, this is a comment from Stan, uh, 10.4 was the smoothest release ever. Um, that was great to see. We definitely want to establish a, a track record of these, like 10.5, 10.6, 10.7. If, if they continue to go this way, I feel like we've solved something, but it was great to kind of like get here. We had a very straightforward and actually a very short retrospective document for 10.4, which is, which is good. It feels like we're getting, we're getting good at this. So thanks to Marin, Luke, and Robert, who kind of drove that release, and, uh, and keep it up, please. Um, people, uh, so we, we added 16 people to our team, uh, which is great. Um, I think we did it with uh, you know, raising the, the technical and cultural standards, um, and, uh, and we still managed to add quite a few people to our team. So we're excited for all our new team members, and, uh, and it's something that, that managers and interviewers put a lot of time and, and effort into. Um, we're trying to get more efficient at this, you know, the technical screening process, we're doing some self-service things and, and that yield led to a couple higher. So that was good to see. And we need to, we do need to get better at making sure we're, we're efficient, that we're, we're targeting, you know, some low rent areas for specific roles. And we need to start doing some, some active sourcing there to, uh, to get better at that. And then unfortunately we had two, two departures. It's always a shame to see people go. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I like the team that we have going forward and they, I've been pleasantly surprised with our ability to, to add to it and to, uh, to add to it in a way that preserves our, our culture and, uh, and grows it. Um, hiring efficiently, yeah, this is really about, um, you know, uh, um, making sure we're a global company and making sure we're a distributed company, um, you know, hiring people all over. It means we, we're hiring in places we don't have benchmarks, we need to get benchmarks. Um, we need to do active sourcing in areas um, but this is a, this is an important thing. It's a, it's a win-win. We can hire someone in an area that's a very efficient place for us money wise. Uh, it's a great offer for them. It raises their standard of living. So in that sense, it's a win-win. And then the more efficient we are in building the company that we want to build, it in increases the value of all of our, uh, all of our equity. And so, uh, we love referrals. Uh, and those of you who are in, uh, who are in areas that are, uh, you know, have, beneficial real estate prices. We're all, we're all jealous of that. Those of us that live in you know, New York and San Francisco and these other places, if, if you're lucky enough to live in one of these places, please refer your friends um, because it's, it's a, it's a win-win for them and for the company, uh, the more, more efficient we are with hiring. Um, but that's, that's probably our, our biggest challenge today on the, on the people front is, uh, is uh, you know, adding great people and making sure we're doing it in a way that's consistent with our global values and uh, in, in particular that efficiency core value. Um, so that's it. Um, questions? Let me uh, let me move over to the chat here. Um, oh, Sid said sorry, he was unmuted. No worries, Sid. Um, Clement, shouldn't it be front end and back end engineers versus developers on the new hire section? Um, yes, that's probably correct. Developers are preferred uh, nomenclature. That's probably just me thinking back to to past companies. So I need to, I need to retrain myself there. Thanks for calling me out on that. Um, any, any other questions from anybody else? What's the best way to suggest people to hire, uh, Philippe, uh, one of our, one of our new additions actually. So, um, I think there's a hiring Slack channel. I think there's a people app Slack channel to the extent you're able to go into lever and actually see the recruiter for a given role. You can, you know, kind of shorten the time by going directly to those people. But I think, you know, when in doubt, just get into that people apps channel, and and they're pretty responsive. They'll uh, they'll pick you up, and they'll uh, they'll get that person um, uh, in in lever and in front of the hiring manager. And it looks like Sean uh, Sean actually linked to the handbook page uh, about how to make a referral. So we've got a process there. Anything from anybody else? Uh, Jason P, a reminder that the handbook should always be the single source of truth. Yes, uh, and uh, um, Sid and I merged a, a comment, um, I think it was about a month ago, but it was about being handbook first. So the extent that you are thinking about a process change, um, those of us from past companies are accustomed to maybe doing a, uh, a Google presentation or a Google Doc, using that to collaborate, getting consensus, and then rolling out the process and announcing it. Um, and then getting it into the handbook to make it official. Try to flip that around and do it the other way. Try to propose the process in the form of a merge request to the handbook, have the discussion, the, the, to the extent consensus or communication is needed, do that in the discussion of the merge request, and that way you can go in front of Sid if he's the ultimate approval, and he can just read a diff and, and you know that the, the lines removed or things we're not doing anymore, the new lines or the change lines are, are what the proposal is, and then it goes right into the handbook. So being handbook first really increases the likelihood that it gets into the handbook 
and therefore the handbook can truly be the the single source of truth that we uh that we want it to be and let me tell you like you know everybody loves the handbook internally but i would say 90 percent of people that i interview bring it up to me um without prompting like people a lot of people read a significant portion of it just in the interview process or they're aware of it and so um, people even outside the company value it and people that want to work here it's it's always in their top reasons of, of why they want to work here so let's uh let's preserve it and uh and uh and and have it live up to um uh, to the ambition of, of being that single source of truth and being uh, as open and transparent as possible uh anything else from anybody going once going twice okay uh well thanks for thanks for watching and uh you got 15 minutes left and i'll see you on the team call cheers